Daniel is a team evangelist, and he works part-time and gives part-time to the ministry of evangelism. Now, he hasn't, hasn't always done that, have you? But uh, uh, he is also a physiotherapist, which means he, he actually helps people get better. <laughs> but we hope that he will make us better today with the word that he speaks to us. And I'll just give you an open pulpit there. Daniel, please, let me, let me pray for you. Will you stretch out your hands towards him? And we'll just, Father, we would ask that you will give Daniel a message for us here today. And we pray that you'll speak through him, that he'll feel a freedom and an anointing upon him, Father, so that uh, the message that he brings is just this amazing divine appointment that is meant to be here today and that you are using your servant to minister to your church and to help your church to grow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Thank you, Luca. Well, it's great to be here. Um, and as Luca says, um, I'm Dan, and um, I live in Watford. And um, he said I'm a part-time evangelist. I'd slightly, uh, part-time evangelist, I'd slightly correct that. I'd say I'm a full-time evangelist. Just it happens to be that part of the time I'm with Mission 24, and part of the time um, I'm, I'm just doing it in as part of my ordinary life. That's what I feel the Lord has called me to. And it's been brilliant to be here, well, we're not in Leicester here, but in Leicestershire. Um, this week in Leicester, we've seen over 220 people give their lives to Jesus, uh, either on the street in Leicester or in, or in services, um, in the evening services, as we've been preaching the gospel and sharing the good news of Jesus with people, whoever we've met. And we've seen lives changed, we've seen people healed, we've seen people set free into the purposes for which God has called them. And it's been wonderful to be here, and I know that we're going to be back in Leicester and Leicestershire at various points over the next few years as we follow the Lord into all that he's called us um, as Mission 24, but also into, uh, into this area where God has a great plan for Leicestershire. He's got a great plan for this church, and we know that his hand is on Lugger and, and this church, and as we step into his purposes and we, be, we follow him, follow Jesus, we know that he will lead us and to see people saved, to see people set free, to see people healed into the purposes for which Jesus has called us. So I've got a couple of uh, friends with me, Jenny and, and John, and, uh, and this is the thing. It's about a dynamic relationship with a living person. I don't know if you've ever come to a church and felt like I'm just going through the motions. I've come because I always come, or I come because I think it's the right thing to do, or it's going to make me a better person, or anything like that. And that, that's my experience as I was growing up. I was born into a Baptist family, and my dad was a Baptist minister, and I, I cannot tell you a moment where I didn't know Jesus. Um, apparently there was a moment where I prayed a prayer to invite Jesus into my life when I was four or five. I can't really remember that. Um, but I do remember going to church and thinking it's the right thing to do. I knew I was saved, I knew I was loved by God, I knew I was loved and, and saved by Jesus. But actually, I would come to church and it would become like a ritual. I would sing songs, I would hear from God's words, I would pray. I even started reading through the Bible. I first read the Bible through a year when I was 11. And those things were good things. And I would encourage you to do those things. But I was doing it more out of religion than I was out of a relationship with the living God, the one who loves us, the one who paid the price for us to have that relationship with him. And so I was in that moment where I, I was doing things out of religion, wanting to please God, but not, I guess, really knowing how, because God sent Jesus into the world that we might be his children, that we might be able to come to him as a child comes to his parent. You know, it's great to see children here, and I love the way that the children play and, and the way they come to their parents and, and by the way it doesn't matter if children make noise when I was uh, speaking in lockdown when I was in my room and my three kids who were uh, three three and two were running around the house um, you know and they were banging on the door as I was preaching it's okay noise is good um, but when children come to their parents they come with complete freedom complete open arms and they ask and they, they just ha they enjoy cuddles they enjoy being with their parents because their parents are showing love to them. And they love running into their arms. And that's why Jesus came, so that we can then come into that relationship and run into the Father's arms who are wide open. 
And as we do so, as John rightly says, the Holy Spirit is given to us as a gift. He is given to us so that we might be able to carry out the purposes that God has given us in this world, but also that we might know God better, that we might sense him in every moment, in every place that we're in, whatever we're doing, and especially in church. If we come out of religion, we might get something out of it. But if we come in relationship, then we come to know the living God. And that's why Jesus came. And the thing is, we all started in our relationship by becoming aware of who we are and who God is. And actually, sometimes we come out of ritual and religion because we forget who we are. We forget that we are children of God. We forget that he has paid the price for us so that we can come into his presence. And we forget who God is. And the Bible is really clear about who God is. We often hear sermons about how, how God is love, and of course that's true. We, we love the verses that say, The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. We love those verses. We talk about coming to our Father, we come to the shepherd who loves us. We, we talk about the story of the, of the prodigal son where the father runs to the child and the arms open wide and we love to hear about the God of love. And of course, that is absolutely true. God is love. He doesn't just show love. He is love. He is the perfect epitome of what love is. And we see that most perfectly revealed in the person of Jesus. God is love. Sometimes we forget about the other side of God. So he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. But then it goes on to say that he by no means clears the guilty. It it goes on to say that our Father, and then it's in heaven, hallowed be your name. You see, he is Father and he is love, but he is also holy. And do we realize that as we come into his presence, we come to a holy God, a God who is mighty and majestic, who sits on the throne of heaven and who loves to pour out his love. But we come in fear because he is mighty. Now, Jesus mean, the, what Jesus did means that we can step in confidence into his presence. But we must never come without realizing that we are coming to the living God, who is the creator, who is the sustainer, who is the Lord of all and holds power in his hand. We come out of fear of the Lord. The Bible encourages us so many times to fear the Lord. Teach us your ways, O Lord. Unite our heart that we might fear your name. And I just want to look briefly at at that side of of God's character, of his nature, because I think it will be helpful in the way that we approach God, both in terms of our relationship with him outside of church and inside inside church meetings like this. Because when I, when I was younger, I, I kind of thought I could just come as in, in whatever state and it didn't matter. Now, of course, we can come as we are. I'm not suggesting that we can't. But actually, we come to the living God to worship him because he is worthy to be praised, because he is Lord of all, because he is king. And I just want to look at one passage. If you've got your Bibles, um, turn to Isaiah 6. Um, And this great passage of how Isaiah meets God in the throne room. And and we can look at at how we can fear the Lord through this passage. And, And as you turn there, let's pray that the Lord might open our eyes to what he wants to say to us here in this place. Open our ears. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it has the power to change and transform us. Thank you that you are here with us by your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, I pray that you will open our eyes to see you. You will open our ears to hear from you. And you will speak, Lord, for your your servants are listening. And, Lord, I pray that where people need a miracle today, where they need healing, Lord, that they will be healed where people need to be set free, Lord, you will set them free. Where people need to be saved, Lord, that you will, you will save them from their sins. Lord, come and have your way in this place. We welcome you to do whatever you want to do. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So this is Isaiah 6, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You might have a different version in your, in your hand. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So this is a beautiful picture of what Isaiah sees when he enters the throne room of God. He sees the Lord high and lifted up, the Lord mighty and majestic, so mighty and majestic that the angels, that they cannot even look at the Lord because he's so pure, so holy, so mighty, so majestic. They clearly fear the Lord. And we see a number of things that say what to fear the Lord means here. And I just want to look at those very briefly today. The first one is to fear the Lord is to be aware of sin. And this happens throughout the Bible. It starts right at the beginning when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. And they've committed that first sin by taking the fruit. And they're in that place where they are aware that who they are. They are aware of their nakedness. They are aware of their shame. They are aware of their sin. And it says that Adam and Eve, they hid from the Lord. To fear the Lord is to be so aware of their own sin, so aware of the things that they have done wrong. That's to fear the Lord. And then we see that in other places as well. We see it in in Exodus 19. So the Israelites have been taken out of Egypt. The Lord has done this dramatic rescue. And they're now in in the plains of Sinai. And the Lord is about to give the law to Moses. And the fire and the lightning and the smoke descends on the mountain. They can see the Lord is mighty and he is majestic. And the people say, do not allow him to speak to us, Moses. Because if we do, we will die. They're so aware of their own sin, so aware of their own weaknesses, so aware of their own failures, that in the presence of the Lord, they know that they cannot stand. It says in Psalm 130, if you, were, if you O Lord, were to number our sins, who could stand? None of us could stand in the presence of God in our own sin because he is such a holy God and we are so sinful, we are so corrupt, we are so far away from his purposes we have sinned and in his presence we become aware of our sin and if you think that's just an old testament thing if you think that it's just god of the old testament but in the new testament we just see a god of love that's not true because when peter first encountered jesus when jesus called peter and he catches this mighty net of fish that peter himself could not do and peter comes to jesus and he says away from me lord for i am a sinful man In the presence of Jesus, he was so aware of his sin. In the presence of God, we become so aware of our sin. And I don't know about you, but the word sin in some churches, in some places in this country, it's kind of gone out of fashion. We don't don't like it. We'd rather use things like mistakes or, or failures or things like that. But let's call it what the Bible calls it. It is sin. And that means that we have, we have done what God didn't want us to do. We have fallen far short of what he wanted for us. That we are not doing what he has asked us to do. We are not glorifying God. That is what sin means. And a few years ago, I was invited into a home of someone in near where I live. And I went with another church leader in the, in the area. And I was invited into this home. And the first thing that I noticed as I walked into this house was this enormous dog. Kind of like, so scary as in, I don't really want to go into this place. And uh, this elderly lady uh, welcomed us in. And we were here to talk to them about Jesus. They, they wanted to speak to us. 
Um, and so we, we spoke to them. But in, I was kind of in fear. I wasn't in fear of God at the time. I was in fear of the dog. Um, I, and didn't really want to be there. But the, the dog was kind of put outside. And then I was able to focus with this couple. And as we did so, we were sharing them about the love of God and how, how he has come so that we can walk into his presence and that we can know God as our saviour and we can know him as our Lord and that he will rescue us from our sin. And as we did so, the presence of God hit that room and this, this man, this big elderly gentleman who was fierce and he was aware of, of, of the power that he would have had as a younger man, as the strength and that he held no prisoners. He took no prisoners. And he, in that moment, started weeping. And he said, Lord, forgive me for my sin. And he started listing the things that he had done. So in the presence of God, he was so aware of his sin. And he was able to repent from them. And we were able to lead him into a relationship with Jesus where his sins would be forgiven. But in God's presence, he was so aware of his sin, he couldn't help but pour out before him and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And I need you. And I used to think, growing up in the church, that I wasn't that bad. I knew that Jesus had saved me, but I also thought that I wasn't that bad as a person. You know, I'd, I'd never done anything majorly wrong. I'd ne not stolen much and I hadn't, um, hadn't murdered anyone, and I'd never, uh, I'd never committed adultery, and, and um, I hadn't lied except on when I absolutely needed to. Um, and, and I just felt that I was okay. Um, I was okay before God. And I went to university, and I had good intentions. I wanted to follow Jesus at uni. Um, I, I still wanted to read the Bible and to pray, and I, I did. I wanted to lead my friends and the guys that I was living with and the people that were on my course. I wanted to lead them to Jesus. But I also wanted to be popular. And I also wanted to be liked. And, uh, and gradually, those things became more important to me than what Jesus wanted for my life. And so as I was in my flats, as, as I started university, we'd be starting to drink. And I'd, I'd, I'd get involved in some of the games around the drinking. And some of the conversations that weren't healthy, I'd, I'd start talking about that and... Um, I wasn't particularly kind to people. And, um, and yes, I was aware of this thing within me that was kind of that was building up and saying, Dan, you know you're not living right. But um, whenever that kind of came, I'd be like, okay, you're absolutely right. And then someone would say, Dan, do you want a drink? And then, yeah, okay, I'll have a drink. And I, I'd, start to, I'd start to drink. Um, and I would have fun and I would basically do as I pleased and what my friends would suggest that I should do that was healthy for me and this all kind of built and there was sometimes I'd go to church and I'd be hung over and um, I'd be desperate for there not to be communion um, and I, I was really you know in that place where I would go in this guilt cycle I don't know whether you've ever been in this guilt cycle where you wanted to do something right and then when it came to it, you didn't do it right and then afterwards you realise you'd done it wrong and you think, Lord, help me and then it would then just go back in this cycle. And this all came to a head on my 20th birthday when we went out as we did on every birthday in the house and we'd have a few drinks and this time I, I drank more than I should have done. <laughs> if, well, more than I should have, should have done, if you know what I mean. I, more than I normally would. And um, I became centre of attention as the as it normally happens in my in, in birthdays. And uh, a song from the Killers came on, and um, they would gather around me, and I was right in the middle, and I'd be dancing and doing some stupid things. And then I just suddenly saw, as all these arms came pointing at me, he doesn't look a thing like Jesus, buddy. And I carried on dancing. I thought it was great. I had a lot of fun. And then when I woke up the next morning, I heard the voice in my mind, he doesn't look a thing like Jesus. fell on my knees and I was so aware of my sin and I knew I didn't look a thing like Jesus and in God's presence there I recommitted my life to Jesus and that's not to say I didn't make mistakes after that it's not to say that I've, I've stopped sin sinning but since that moment, it's been my prayer that I will look like Jesus and that I wouldn't sin. 
And before then, I'd have said, what's, what's the matter with sin? Why does it really matter? You know, and as long as you're not doing too much harm to people, what does it really matter? Well, the Bible says in, in Romans 1 that the wrath of God has been poured out on all unrighteousness and, and all ungodliness. And there's two different things here. If you think about the first four of the Ten Commandments, it's talking about godliness. It's about being aware of who God is. It's being aware that he is Lord and that no, there is no other and that we must put him first. So that is about godliness. And then the rest are about righteousness. In other words, the way that we behave towards each other, not murdering, not stealing, and so on. And, and the Bible says that both of those are sins, but at the root of it all is ungodliness. In other words, that we are not giving God the glory for who he is, that we are not living for him, we are not putting him first in everything that we do, that, that we will stand in his presence and, and be aware that he is Lord. And the Bible says that the wrath of God has been poured out against all ungodliness. So any time that we haven't put God first, that is sin. And it's not just when we do those big things, that we, the big crimes that we think about. You see, the wrath of God. And again, it's not something that's popular, but the wrath of God is his righteous anger against sin. Because if he is judge, if he is Lord of all, he cannot be holy if he just says, it's okay, don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. We all know that if, if there was anarchy in this land and, and it didn't matter what you did and the law wasn't upheld. I've, I've been to Africa and I don't know if you've ever driven in Africa. They, um, it can be chaos and the reason it's chaos is because nobody obeys the rules. So I was in Sierra Leone once and we were coming down this road and there was this huge traffic jam and we're in, a, a, in this traffic jam and when we get to the front of the traffic jam we realise what the problem is. Someone has decided to go onto the opposite side of the road because it's quicker and so everyone switched lanes so they're going across like that and there are diggers in the middle of the road and there are holes and, and nothing works because it's chaos. Okay? Now none of us likes being punished for driving fines <laughs> but if we didn't have them in this country then we'd end up a bit like that and that's just what we might call a minor offense if, if a judge didn't punish something major we would say that's not fair if a judge didn't punish a murderer we wouldn't feel safe it wouldn't be right we would say that the the, the judgment doesn't fit the crime the punishment doesn't fit the crime and it's exactly the same with sin. If God just said, don't worry about it, we would be aware that the punishment doesn't fit the crime. And the punishment for sin, the Bible says this over and over again, is death. And the death is the punishment that we must take. And the truth is, for each of our sin, for each of our sin, someone has to pay the penalty. Someone has to pay. It's either us or it's someone who does it on our behalf. And this is the thing. When I talk about sin, it can be uncomfortable. <laughs> and if we left it there, and in fact, in Paul, uh, Paul writes in Romans 7, and says, oh, what a wretched man I am. If we left it like that, who could stand? No one can stand in God's presence because we are all sinners and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But that is not how it finishes because it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We have been redeemed by him. We have been set free. And that verse that says, who could stand, then says, but there is forgiveness in God. And ultimately, it is in the person of Jesus, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through, through faith, that God might be just. You see, Jesus has set us free from our sins. He came to the cross and our sin was laid on him. There are lots of big words in there, in there, justified. It means that we are declared righteous, that we are declared right before God. That we have been redeemed, that, that we have been bought by the precious blood of Christ. And then propitiation, what that means is that Jesus' sacrifice, not only is it an act of love, that his blood was poured out for us, but it is an also an act where he appeases the righteous anger of God against sin. In other words, the blood stands and covers us 
And the righteous anger of God was poured out on Jesus instead of on us. And he took the death that we deserved. We have been set free by the death of Jesus. And to prove that Jesus' sacrifice was enough, to prove that what he did on the cross was enough to set us free, he was raised back to life again. And to show that the death cannot even hold him. And that death will not hold us if we come to Jesus. And we can live and rule and reign with him forever because he is Lord and actually he has come to set us free from our sin. And we can come back into that relationship with him. This is the good news of the gospel that our sins have been laid on Jesus and then we receive his life, his righteousness. The great exchange, the most unjust thing that has ever happened on this earth, that Jesus, the perfect, spotless, blameless, pure lamb of God was placed on the cross and, and murdered for us. He took the death that we deserved. And so the righteous anger of God against sin was satisfied. And let's not think about this as if it is God appeasing God, uh, sorry, Jesus appeasing God reluctantly. No, it was for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. This was a plan made by both God the Father and God the Son and Jesus willingly took the role and came down and he became the propitiation for our sin. So to fear the Lord is to be aware of our sin, but it's also to be aware of his salvation from sin. We have been set free from his sin, from our sin, because of what he did for us. And I just want to read from Romans 5, because this is a beautiful picture of what it means for those who have given their lives to Jesus. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. That's the ultimate in our lives, isn't it? That we have peace with God. You know, last year, one of my closest friends was diagnosed with cancer. I, I was 32 at the time, and we went to school together. We were, we were in the same year. She was 32. She has kids similar age to, my, to mine. And she was diagnosed in April last year with stomach cancer. And we prayed and we fasted and we asked the Lord to come and do something wonderful in her life and heal her from the cancer. But three weeks later, she died. But as she was dying, she wrote about lots of important things on Facebook. She wrote about her family and her friends. And she wrote about, um, uh, about her kids and some of the important things in her life. But the one thing that stood out more than anything else, she said, I know where I'm going. I'm safe in the, in the arms of God the Father. And whatever happens, I'm saved. That isn't just peace from God, although it was. It is peace with God. She was so aware that her sins had been forgiven, that she was saved, and that she, whatever happened in this body, she would still be alive. That she was confident of where she was going. That was peace with God. So to fear God is to be aware of sin. And then some, some quicker things, but I just want to emphasize, to fear God is to know, the, know his power. Going back to that Isaiah passage, when it says in verse four, the foundations of the threshold shook. So in the presence of God, there is power. And ultimately, there is power in the name of Jesus. I would just want to read this remarkable story from Mark 5. Um, it's quite a long passage, but I think it speaks for itself. It says this. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. Notice that lots of these people in the presence of God, they fall at his feet. This is what happens when he's here. They fall at his feet because they're just so aware of who he is. So Jairus fell at his feet. Fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. 
And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. There is power in the name of Jesus to heal. Even just a touch of his cloak and she was made well. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down. Notice she fell down in fear and trembling before the living God, before Jesus, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Notice the role of faith. When we believe what Jesus said, we can receive what he promises. And he promises that as we come to him, that he will bring healing. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's home some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And I just wonder if this is a word for some of us today. That some of us maybe once prayed for something. Prayed for healing, prayed for something. And you stop praying. And the verse from James springs to mind where it says, you do not have because you do not ask. Why trouble the teacher? Well, because there is power in the name of Jesus. But overhearing what they said, Jesus to the ruler, uh, so what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Again, a verse for us today. Do not fear, only believe. Have faith in what Jesus said. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. They were suddenly aware of how great, how powerful Jesus was. And to fear the Lord is to know his power. And not just to know the words in this book, which is wonderful. It's, we need to know the words of this book, but also to receive the power that Jesus gives us. It's what John was talking about earlier. It is, is what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is when um, Jesus said to his disciples, you will be clothed with power from on high. You, you will be clothed with his power. So that it's not just Jesus who healed 2,000 years ago, but that he gives the power and authority to go and heal the sick today. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we lay the hands on the sick, it is as if Jesus himself is laying his hands on the sick as well. The first person I ever saw healed on the street was in a place called Silverdale uh, a couple of years ago. And we got to the end of our time on the streets and I hadn't seen anything major. And um, I came up to this woman and I just said, is there anything that God for do, can do for you? Even a miracle, what would you ask him for? And she was off to an eye appointment because she had an issue with her eye. It was sore, it was red, and she didn't know what was going on. This is a very simple thing, a very simple example of what Jesus can do. And so I said, well, can I pray for you? And I'm going to pray for you in Jesus' name that you will be healed. Anyway, I just, all I did was put my hands on her and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. May your eyes be restored to what they were. And then she said, oh, I'm better. Anyway, she went to this eye appointment and they gave her a completely clean bill of health she had been completely healed and then she came along to our evening meeting and she said this to to the guys there and then she gave her life to Jesus because there is power when we lay hands on those who are sick and Jesus comes to heal Jesus comes to bring life Jesus comes to set people free there is power in Jesus name and by his own wonderful grace he gives us the power to carry out his purposes 
and I didn't feel anything special. All I did was lay hands and believed. And we could give so many testimonies of what God has done in terms of healing. But today there is healing. And there's not just healing, but there is also the Holy Spirit that Jesus wants to give to us so that we might be equipped. And tongues is part of that, but actually it's so much more than that. He wants to equip us to also go and do his work, which is to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the leper, and to bring salvation in his name. So to fear the Lord is to know his power. And then thirdly, to fear the Lord is to worship him. In verse 3 of Isaiah 6, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is filled with his glory. It is to worship him. It is to know and recognize who he is, that he is holy and majestic and wonderful. And so, yes, we can come into church as we are. We can come, but we come to a holy God and we worship him for who he is, the great God, the great I am. And he is Lord of all. And we see this throughout the Bible. We see this in 1 Chronicles 7 when Solomon is dedicating the temple and they have all these sacrifices around and the fire comes down from heaven and and consumes the sacrifices and the only thing that people can do is to bow on their faces before the presence of God. And then again in Ezekiel 43 where Ezekiel has this vision of the glory of God filling uh, filling the temple, we see him fall on his face And then again in in Revelation 4, the angels are still singing the same song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts who was and is and is to come. He is worthy to receive all glory and honour and power and praise. That is to fear the Lord. And the elders are constantly falling down before him and laying down their crowns and saying, he is Lord and he is holy and he is worthy to be praised. That is what it means to worship. And just a simple example of what that means, Joshua, I don't know what you think about Joshua. Joshua was the mighty warrior who led Israel out of the wilderness into the promised land. He's the great military leader, someone who was full of action, full full of power, full of military might. And yet the first thing we see about Joshua is in Exodus 33, where it says that Moses and Joshua entered the tent of meeting. Moses would meet with God and then he would come out, but Joshua stayed in the presence of God. So before he was a military leader, before he was a warrior, he was a worshipper. So before we do anything, to fear the Lord is to worship him because he is worthy of our praise. And then linked to worship, we see this, to fear the Lord is to obey. So worship isn't just singing, it's not just declaring who God is, that is absolutely part of it, but equally, it is about the obedience to do whatever Jesus says, here I am, send me. Verse 8 of Isaiah 6, here I am. That is the essence of worship. That whatever God says, that we might stand in his presence and say, here am I, send me. And the story of the Israelites was one of continual cycles where to fear the Lord meant that they were in a position where they would recognize who God was. Say, Lord, we commit to you, we will fear you. And then they go away from him. They follow other gods or they get distracted. And then they they get taken away from God's presence, either physically into Babylon or, or in that moment where they might be defeated in battle. And then they'd come back to the Lord and they'd fear him and God would restore them. And this was a continual cycle. When they feared the Lord, they saw great victories. When they didn't, they were defeated and they were separated from God's presence. Their sin got in the way. And that was my story. That when I didn't truly fear the Lord, when I came to church with a very laissez-faire attitude, I, I, I can take it or leave it, it doesn't matter that I drifted away from the presence of the Lord. And as I have grown in my relationship with Jesus, I've realized that I must fear him. And my prayer is, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I might rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. May there be no more compromise that I might fear your name. And as I finish, I just want to come back to where we started talking about sin. You see, Jesus 
is the ultimate example of obedience. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was on his knees, trembling about what he had to do. In absolute agony, that blood and sweat would be pouring from him. And he was aware of what he was about to do. And this is strange, isn't it? Because Jesus himself said, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets before him. And he said, and Paul writes, rejoice in your sufferings. And, and, and James also writes, consider it pure joy in your sufferings. So how comes Jesus here in this moment of, of fear and agony was in that place where even though he said others, do not fear, is because he was going to do the thing that none of us could possibly even imagine to bear. He was about to bear the sin of the whole world. He was about to have the separation from God the Father that sin gives us, and he'd never experienced it. And the whole weight of sin was about to be placed on him, and the wrath of God was about to be poured out on him. Yes, he was going to die a torturous death, but it was so much more than that. He was about to die for our sin. And he stood before Pilate, and Pilate said, do you not know that I have the power to, that, I, that, you have the pow- that I have the power to acquit you or to condemn you? And he said, you would not have power unless it was given to you from on high. And it says, Pilate marked because he was so aware of who Jesus was. And as Jesus hung on the cross and he breathed his last, even the centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. He paid the price for my sin. He paid the price for your sin to set us free, to bring us hope, to bring us power, to bring us healing. So as I finish, I'd love to pray with you. And the first thing that I would like to do is to invite every single one of us, whatever our background, whether we've been coming to church for years or whether we've been coming for a couple of weeks, do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Have you feared the Lord and aware of our own brokenness and sin before him? Because today is the day of salvation. Jesus has come to set us free. And I implore you, if you are not sure or certain about the freedom and the forgiveness and the salvation that is in Jesus, today you can pray a prayer and welcome Jesus into your heart, even for the first time. Or maybe as a recommitment to say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to fear you as you deserve. You are God, you are King, and I want to worship you with my life. I want to lay down my life so that you will be first and that I will glorify you in everything that I do. Today is the day of salvation. I implore you, come home to Jesus, have your sins forgiven, be set free, and be given the life to which Jesus has called us. So let's pray. And I invite us all to pray with me. Pray these words after me, and maybe it's for the first time, or maybe it's a recommitment. And for those of us who have prayed this prayer before, let's pray it anyway, to support those who are maybe praying it for the first time. Pray after me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. Thank you that you rose again. Thank you that you are alive and you have come to give me life. I'm sorry for living life my own way. That changes today. I choose to follow you. Fill me with your spirit. That I might live for you. And I boldly confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. I want to love you and serve you. Every day of my life. In Jesus name. Amen. And while every eyes are closed, I'm going to give an opportunity for us to respond and to take a public step. 
and the first step of which is to acknowledge publicly that Jesus has come into our lives. Because Jesus said that if you confess me before people, then I will confess you before my Father. But if you don't, he won't. So I'm going to count to three. And if you today, for the first time or as a recommitment, prayed that prayer, and you want to say, I'm, I'm following Jesus, I'm choosing to follow him and to fear him all the days of my life, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand when I get to three. Okay, one, two, three. Raise your hands. Wonderful. Bless you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Are there any more? Wonderful. Okay, I see those hands. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I believe we're going to take communion in a second, aren't we? Um, so the guys who have raised your hands there, that's the first step. Wonderful. But we'd also really love to pray with you. So as we come forward for communion... Um, I'm going to stand over here. My team will stand over here and we'd love to pray with you and, and just, um, yeah, and we're not going to do anything weird or funny. <laughs> we're just going to lay hands on you and pray with you and, and welcome you into, your king, into God's kingdom. And there is one other prayer that I would love to pray with each of us just before I finish. And that is that for some of us, we've been going to church for a long time. And some of us have been in a place where perhaps this has become religion rather than relationship. Perhaps we've ceased fearing the Lord as we should. And it's become something that's mundane. And the Lord invites us into a dynamic relationship with him. But it starts with obedience, with fearing him. And so I'm going to invite those of us who are able to stand, or if you're not able to stand, just make a, a public acknowledgement. I raise my hands. And... This will be the declaration, as Isaiah said, here am I, send me. We're saying yes to the purposes of God in our lives. So again, I'm going to count to three. And if you want to say, here am I, send me, I invite you to stand when I get to three. One, two, three. Stand if you want to say, here am I, send me. And I'm going to pray for you now and invite the Holy Spirit just to fall on you. So Father, we thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you are Lord of all, you are King. And we worship you here. And each one of us says here, here am I, send me. Whatever you say, whatever you want to do, Lord, do it now. And Holy Spirit, fall on us. Fall on us and equip us and empower us to do the things that you have called us to. And be glorified in this place. Be high and lifted up. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray.